Thank you. And I want to thank um, Kate and Cheryl and all the people who helped get me here, and it's really great to be here. And what I want to talk about is, um, and I've been looking forward to coming to Davis for quite a while because of all the One Health work that's going on here, and it's really a great series that you have, and I was looking at the other speakers that you brought, and really some fantastic speakers, and I'll try to live up to their example. But um, what I want to talk about is, is an MD perspective on One Health, and I just wonder right off the bat, how many people here are in animal health, veterinary medicine, and how many are in human medicine, human health? So that's what I want to talk about, actually. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the whole issue of, while One Health is defined, this is from Davis' website, from the, the One Health um, Center and Institute that you have here, which is fantastic, that One Health is a collaboration of various scientific disciplines looking for health of humans, animals, and ecosystems. Um, I want to talk to, about the fact that sometimes when you go to a One Health meeting or give a One Health talk, um, there, it's, it's not that many different disciplines together, and that whereas One Health seems to have a lot of traction with veterinary medicine and veterinary schools, um, and there's definitely some interest in the public health community, especially when you look at things like emerging infectious diseases, and I just wanted to make sure everybody knows, I mean, this is the extent of legitimacy in the public health community is that the World Health Organization and the World Organization for Animal Health, OIE, as well as the UN Food and Agriculture Organization that coordinates a lot of animal health things around the world. Um, three international public health groups that really traditionally don't work together very easily have actually gotten together and had a tripartite resolution saying that One Health is great, we're all going to work together, and we're going to help fight emerging infectious diseases with this model. So it's really been some major developments there. At the same time, coming from a med school like Yale, and I tell people about One Health at Yale, and I get mostly a total blank stare, there's really limited awareness of One Health in the medical community across the country, and Davis may be ahead of the pack in some terms of that. I think a lot of times I was at a One Health meeting on Monday in, in D.C., and there was, um, again, mostly animal health people. I was one of the few human health people, but there was nobody from environmental health, and theoretically, One Health is sort of human, animal, environmental health, and, but environmental health sometimes feels left out. And the other thing you hear about One Health is, well, it's great if you're in Africa or in the developing world somewhere, and there's a global health idea, but in this country, probably doesn't apply. We don't really need One Health in this country because everybody's doing so great anyway. Uh, <clears throat> And so I'm going to ask you to think about what are the reasons why it's so hard to engage um, people like me in the medical community in the One Health idea, and does it apply to clinical settings in the United States? And a lot of you um, are going to end up spending a lot of your professional time in the United States, and is the One Health something that's really going to be relevant to the work you do? And I'm going to ask you to look at three barriers to why um, One Health often ends up as some health, and the first one is, I'm going to just talk about the attitudes that I see in the medical community, because I talk about One Health to a lot of doctors a lot of times. And there's sort of an us versus them attitude that I run into that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the issue of who pays for One Health anyway, especially in a clinical setting. And I want to talk about the fact that a, a real growth area that I think for One Health has really not been explored enough which is the idea of animal workers and their occupational health. And that includes you, uh, any of you that actually do animal health work. Um, and so the, the, the attitude that I run into that I think is just part of our way we're trained in medicine is that when, if the issue of animals come up and the issue of animal health comes up, it's kind of an us versus them, which is that animals get rabies, animals get avian influenza, animals get leptospirosis, all these sort of nasty things that they could cause zoonotic disease. And on top of that, they also cause allergies, they bite you. I mean, you know, if you want to keep people healthy, what you really want to do is kind of keep them away from the animals. So we want to sort of vaccinate the animals, get rid of the disease as much as possible on animals, vaccinate people, um, isolate people from animals, you know, get rid of the cat, um, stay far away from the sick flock of animals. And if you, if you have to, you know, eliminate animals. There are all a bunch of sick, sick pigs, sick animals, uh, sick birds. Um, you need to do some sort of uh, elimination for, for public health reasons as well as animal health reasons. So the sort of us versus them makes us really want to keep humans and animals kind of far apart, which is pretty far away from the One Health idea. 
And I think also what we do in clinical medicine is that we can't see the human health implications of sick animals. I, I, I work at Yale where there's actually many more animals than people. There's about 70,000 animals at Yale. Um, even though there's no vet school and there's no ag school right there, but we have 70,000 animals. The thing is they're all rats and mice. And every person who's cutting their academic teeth there is working on mice or rats or doing something. But when it comes to the idea that a, an ill dog is important in human health, and they just can't wrap their head around that at all. It's like, if you're not a rat or a mouse, what have you got to do with human health? So I want to talk about a couple of cases, and I show some of these cases to doctors um, to sort of show that there really is maybe some overlap that they don't think about. So this is a case, and, and the question is, why are you telling me about your dog? And it's a true case, actually a case from Connecticut published in the literature, of a woman who takes her Labrador Retriever to a, doc, to a veterinarian because the, the lab doesn't want to get out of bed. And the veterinarian does an exam, notes some physical exam findings like we see in human medicine, ataxia and nystagmus. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but give him some antibiotics, some amoxicillin. The dog, unfortunately, does not get better and ends up getting admitted to a veterinary hospital, really sick, having a lot of neurological problems, stuporous, has a fever, um, has bruises all over, has extensive rigidity, just, just sort of real tense muscles like that. Um, the dog gets a CAT scan, which when I tell doctors about dogs getting CAT scans, they're, they're pretty amazed. The dog gets a lumbar puncture, which um, also human health people have no idea is really happening in, in vet medicine. And the lumbar puncture shows evidence of inflammation, white blood cells, and the CAT scan shows dilation of the ventricles and a mass in the brain stem. Um, any idea what the diagnosis is? No human health people have come closer that I know. Then they go, I don't know how to diagnose a dog. <clears throat> but the provisional diagnosis the vet made was there's some mass in the brain, and this could be a tumor. And you talk to the owner and say, look, you know, you've already gotten a CAT scan and a lumbar puncture. The dog's doing terribly. I think we should sort of call it quits. And this is one place that human medicine and animal medicine are kind of different, that the dog is euthanized. And the other thing that's different from human animal medicine is that the veterinarian does a necropsy in the office and takes some tissue samples and starts looking at it. And we, we rarely do autopsies on people anymore, whereas vets, I mean, necropsy is much more part of practice. And in the necropsy, it looks like there's a lot of um, abnormalities, there's some hemorrhage, there's, there's diffuse um, involvement of a lot of different tissues, really consistent with sort of a vasculitis. And as we say in the New England Journal of Medicine, our big medical journal, um, a diagnostic procedure was performed. Any idea now what the diagnosis is? Okay, hold that thought. Um, and the reason I'm giving this case is that two days later, after the dog is euthanized, the dog's owner comes to her doctor and says, I don't feel so good. I've got nausea, vomiting, I've got a fever, I feel terrible, I feel tired. Uh, and by the way, my dog died of cancer two days ago and had the same symptoms. And um, is there a connection? And as doctors, we are not trained to have people tell us that their dog had cancer and maybe there's a connection. I mean, we, there's nothing in our training that gets remotely close to knowing what first thing to do. And like most doctors, the doctor didn't make very much of it at all and sort of said, you know, why are you telling me about your dog with cancer? This is nothing to do with it. So diagnosed with uh, gastroenteritis, the patient, gave her some fluids, sent her home, maybe she's going to feel better. She didn't. She came back to the, uh, to the doctor feeling worse. Fever was worse. She was really kind of uh, confused at that point. She was admitted to the hospital. She had some lab tests showing a um, white blood cell count that was not, uh, not extraordinary. Her, her platelet count was down a little bit. Uh, her hemoglobin was down just a little bit, and her, and her sodium was down just a little bit. She was given a blood spectrum antibiotic, good for most things, levofloxacin. They did some stool cultures, blood cultures. They were all negative. They looked for a few uh, infectious diseases that we see in Connecticut, like Lyme and Ehrlichia. Um, and, they, and those were negative, and so she was sort of called fever of unknown origin and sent home. She was a little bit better with the antibiotics, but really not better. She still had headache and malaise. Um, so any, any last thoughts on what this is? 
So what happened basically was the, um, the veterinary, the diagnostic procedure that the vet did was to send the tissue of the dog to the CDC, and they have a lab there where they can do a immunohistochemistry for rickettsial antigen for, for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, basically. And this is the dog testis staining positive for, um, for the rickettsial antigen for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And as a result, the veterinarian called the doctor, told him what the diagnosis was. The doctor contacted the patient who was then able to get on the correct antibiotic, a tetracycline, doxycycline, because lubefloxacin really doesn't work well for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And her blood test later confirmed that this was acute Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which classically has a rash in humans that starts peripherally and, and moves centrally. The problem is that only about 15 to 20 percent of the time are patients showing up at their doctors with the classic rash and the fever. So many times it's missed, and if you miss the diagnosis it's, it's, and don't treat it with the correct antibiotics, it really has fatal complications. And, and, and if, if you don't die of it, you can have terrible neurologic complications, deafness. Um, brain damage, and, and uh, because of the blood problems, you can have amputation of your limbs and things. So it's not a good thing to miss. And so what really happened here? Was it the problem that the dog licked the person and gave them a zoonotic disease by licking him? Uh, did the same tick that bite the dog bite the woman as well? Uh, did a woman pull the tick off her dog and get infected? That's the way to get infected with a, with a tick-borne disease, but it turned out she didn't know there was any ticks on the dog. Or is it possible that the dog and the woman were both infected from the same environment, that really they just were sort of sharing the risk from the environment and it was tick infested and that's what happened. So any thoughts on that? How many people think it's A? B, C, D? Yeah, so it really looks like um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever has a very spotty distribution around the country, including in Connecticut. You just have little pockets of it here and there, and so we don't always think about it. But there really have been a number of reported cases where by, by detecting it in dogs who get really sick from Rocky Mountain spotted fever, as you know, they're able to find out that there really are a lot of ticks in the area that are carrying it and that it's something that the doctor should think about. There have been cases also where dogs were not, because the vet and the doctor never talked, some people died because the dog had Rocky Mountain spotted fever and nobody put that together with the human illness and there were, there were, un, there were avoidable deaths because of that um, and this, this sort of uh, environmental risk was not recognized. So let me tell you another case along the same lines. This is uh, the question of why are you telling me your cats are sick? And it's a woman who's pregnant and another true case, another published case, um, goes to her obstetrician and says, look, I'm 29 weeks pregnant, but I'm really worried about my cats. They're just not doing well. And uh, what's wrong with the cats? Well, they're, they're pretty sick. They're midge and Pepsi. They're short-haired cats. Uh, they've been sick for about three weeks. They're throwing up. They're treated with um, ranitidine, which is an H2 blocker. We use that in human medicine, too, for ulcers and things. They're still throwing up and not feeling any better with the ranitidine. Any idea what this is? What's that? Say that louder. Toxoplasmosis. That's what the, that's what the human medical people are doing. Pregnancy, cats, must be toxoplasmosis. Do, do cats get sick from toxoplasmosis? So we know that, but the, 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 the doctors all say this. It's a pregnancy. It's a cat. It's toxo. Um, <clears throat> so what do the cats look like? Well, they're not doing so well. They're vomiting. They've got diarrhea. They're anxious. Pepsi's lost uh, almost a kilogram, which I guess if you're a cat is a lot of weight to lose. They're dehydrated. They have swing gait. They're tremorous. Um, the Pepsi's drooling. They're admitted to the veterinary hospital where some tests are done. Again, these are the same tests we would do on a human admitted for some of these problems. It shows uh, there's anemia, there's an elevated liver function test, um, and, and they're given IV fluids, they're given some organ eating by the IV, maybe that'll work a little better, and they send some other blood studies. Mark, do you, think, do you think you know what this is? <laughs> So it turns out that the blood studies come back, and this is, again, the vet sending the blood sample to the veterinary lab. And Mitch has a blood lead level of 135 uh, micrograms per deciliter, where the normal is, is less than 25 in, in cats. And that was our normal level in sort of adult humans. We're moving at a little lower. But 135 is pretty much a fatal level in a human, and it's not so great if you're a cat either. Pepsi has a level of 87, which is also really, really bad. Um, 
The cats are treated with chelation therapy, which is what we do for humans when they get up that high. And Pepsi makes it, but Midge dies. And the veterinarian then tells the pregnant owner of the cats, go talk to your doctor, tell, tell the doctor that the cats have lead poisoning. And so as a result of that, the woman gets her blood tested, and she has a significantly elevated blood level. And it's not enough to kill her, but it is enough where there are associated prenatal effects on the fetus by having a lead level of 40. You really want to have levels less than 10 when you're pregnant and as low as possible. It does pass the placenta very easily, and it's caused, it's been associated with, um, with, with basically uh, decreased IQ in kids that are born with that kind of lead in, in the mother. And so why was she, why, why was all this lead happening in the cats and the, and, and the pregnant woman? Turns out, you know, what do people do when they're getting ready to have a baby? You fix up the baby <laughs> and you probably shouldn't, in an old house, use a blowtorch to get rid of the paint in the old, in, in the baby room, which is what she was doing to strip the wallpaper and things. And uh, it's a great way to put lead into the environment and, and so why should the cat have a higher level than the person? They're both in the same house. Why should the cat's level be higher? You put sort of dust all over the house for the lead in it. Why would cats get a higher level of lead? Any ideas? What's that? Yeah, so what do cats do? They First of all, they're down around the dust all the time. They're sort of low level. And then they sit and lick their fur. And you know, putting lead in your mouth is a great way to get exposed. You can breathe it and get some lead exposure too. But licking it... Um, and sort of licking dust is a great way to get lead poisoning. So it's one reason why the cat really could be, again, sort of a sentinel for humans in the same house because the cat, in this case, is really probably more exposed. And so what I'm proposing is as sort of a solution to this us versus them mentality that, that doctors have is to go to more of a shared risk idea, is that the idea that, that we're all living in the same environments many times. We're sharing household environments, sometimes outdoor environments uh, we're sharing with animals. And we have to um, really take kind of a comparative clinical approach to what's happening in the people, what's happening in the animals from the same environmental hazards. And that that's probably a little more productive than kind of an us versus them mentality where anything related to animal health has nothing to do with human health except maybe a danger that we should then get rid of the animals because of. So it's this whole idea of the canary in the coal mine. And uh, at Yale, we have a database called the Canary Database where we try to put together a lot of the evidence of animals being good sentinels and, and try to make that available to people who kind of want to see evidence about that. And as you know, um, in vet medicine, sometimes humans can be the sentinels for the animals. Sometimes it's the human who comes to care um, and because more money is spent on diagnosis of the human, sometimes that's how you find the problem that the animal is also being exposed to. So it's a sort of animal sentinel idea which really should cut both ways. It's not only animals sentinels for humans, but it's an idea of shared risk instead of us versus them. And remember that in the environment, we talk a lot about zoonotic disease and things, but the environment is more than just biological threats, although those are important, viruses, bacteria, molds. There are other physical hazards like noise, heat, cold, dust, traffic, electromagnetic fields. There's been studies of pets and electromagnetic fields and, and a correlation between lymphoma and dogs and EMF. Um, just think about all the other things in the environment besides just infectious disease. Chemical, there's pesticides, air pollutants that um, sometimes the animals may be good sentinels or vice versa for the humans. And think about social um, factors in the environment as well. One of the first ways that we're trying to put One Health together in Connecticut is that there's a, a bill in the legislature for veterinarians to report any cases of animal abuse to the um, domestic violence services for humans as well because there's pretty good evidence that if a dog or a, a pet is being abused in the house that the people in the house may also be at risk for domestic violence and that having veterinarians talk to somebody if they see an abused pet may help tip them off that, there's a, that there may be a social problem as well. So think about all these different types of environments. It's not all just um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or another infection in the environment. And that ideally, if we could do more of this, then both veterinarians and doctors seeing cases could talk to each other, pick up problems in the environment, and then kind of work together with some input from environmental health. And this is one way to bring environmental health into this whole One Health idea, is once you figure out that there's a problem, then you have to do something about it. And it often takes involving public health, environmental health, 
uh, urban planners, all the things you have to do to actually make an environment better. But that um, if we don't recognize the problems, if we don't start talking to each other that we're seeing this issue, then we're, then we're going to totally miss it. And some things to think about um, in terms of shared environmental risks. Think about obesity, which is an epidemic in dogs, as you know. And is it an epidemic in cats, too? Yes. And so a lot, of, a lot of fat cats and fat dogs, a lot of fat people, too. And they, there's really a relationship that if you have a overweight animal in the house, it's more likely that the human is going to be overweight as well because they're not walking each other, they're not getting outdoors. It could be because of the suburban sprawl and no place to walk, and not everybody can live in Davis where bikes rule and things like that. Um, when melamine poisoning came in this country and there was cases of renal failure in animals all around the country, um, it was thought to be a totally animal issue. The FDA apparently said this is not a human health issue at all. And it wasn't until a couple years later that melamine contamination of infant formula started killing kids in China and things like that. So that's another, I think of that as an environmental problem that was really a sentinel event in, in animals. Air pollution, we're looking more and more at the human health effects of air pollution, but there's been some great studies of, of dogs in polluted areas and, and the changes that they have in their lungs because of that. And there's, a, there's one way to really potentially do more about learning the effects on the animals and the effects on the humans and look at the same. And a specific example where nothing is going on that I really think should be is that we have an epidemic of asthma around the country, especially in kids. And apparently, there is also an epidemic of asthma in cats. And I don't know everything about it, but I know that you know, a lot of veterinarians, are you being taught that, that this is in, incidence is actually increasing of asthma in cats? So why are the cats all getting asthma? Um, are they, just like the, those cats in the lead, are they telling us something about what's in these houses because they're there 24 hours a day? Are they telling us about something that we should know in terms of the epidemic that's happening in people too? And you'd think somebody would put this together if there's two epidemics going on. The problem is when you search the medical literature and you go asthma in cats, do you think you find studies about what's making the cats sick? And every single study of asthma in cats, when you put go into PubMed or MedOne or anything, it's all about cats making people sick, right? And if you have a house and there's a cat, then the reason the person has asthma is because of the cat. It's not that maybe there's something that's making both the cat sick and the human sick. And, and what's happening, I think because of financial reasons, cats are not being tested for allergens. They're not being tested to figure out why are the cats. Has anybody ever tested a cat to see which IgE, the allergen um, antibody they're making? against which allergen in the house. It's really not being done. And as a result, the cats are being treated with inhalers, they're being treated with steroids, and we're not finding out why the cats are sick. And that makes it hard to connect anything to the human health, but it's pretty interesting that there's two epidemics going on. And this, to me, is sort of a growth area. But it gets into the second barrier to going from some health to one health, which is who's going to pay for all this? You know, especially in a clinical level where you have a sick cat, you know, who's going to pay to do the allergy testing? Which, if it was a human, you just pay it and send it to the insurance company, and they pay for it. Um, it's a little different, as you know, with animal health. And here's an example that I had to deal with this firsthand. Um, as, as, as you were hearing, I work in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. We have a clinic where people come to us who feel that they're getting sick, either from their environment or from their work. And here's a 59-year-old guy who works in a factory. He's making light bulbs. And like some people in uh, light bulb factories where there's mercury in the vapor for the fluorescent bulbs, he was getting elevated levels of urine mercury. So he was getting mercury poisoned from working in the factory. And he was taken out of work, and usually when you, when you tell someone to go home and take, take a month off and stay away from the factory, their mercury levels go down. His mercury levels were going up. And so the company said, well, they're going up because he wants to stay home and just sit around all day and watch TV, and he's probably putting a little bit of mercury in his urine test every time you test him, so he's just faking it. We're not going to pay for this guy to take a month off and get workers' comp and things. But when the guy came back to see us, he told us, you know, I took my work boots home and I was walking around the house because the weather was bad and, and then I pulled up the insole of my boot and under the insole was a whole bunch of beads of mercury like this. And mercury vaporizes very easily and every time you step on it, you actually make a little cloud of mercury which then sort of can go into your house. And once it gets in rugs or cracks in wood, sometimes you have to tear a house down because there's been contamination in the house you just can't get rid of and every time you step on the floor, 
floor, you, you bring up a little cloud of mercury, which is especially bad for kids. It's not great for animals either, probably. But we decided to go take a look at the house. And so we went in there with a mercury meter and looking around, we found a little bit of mercury here and there, and the socks we definitely had some mercury on them. And then we noticed there was a, a dog bed in the house, and that there was a, a six-month-old German Shepherd puppy living in the house as well. And so it occurred to us about, well, if, if the company thinks he's faking it, and we think that the house may be making him sick, why not test the dog? It's, the dog's not putting mercury in this urine. You know, why not test the dog? That, that's, that's not a bad idea. So I called up a vet. It was one of the first times I got to actually call up a vet. And I've been talking about doctors and vets communicating. But it, so it was actually good to talk to a vet and told them that the dog could have mercury poisoning. And she said, that's interesting. I haven't seen that. What are the symptoms of mercury poisoning in a dog? Anybody, anybody know? So you don't, you don't think about it a lot. You don't test for it a lot. So I, you know, I said, well, I don't know. But in humans, you have like memory loss and things like that. And so she said, oh, so he doesn't remember getting into the garbage when he was uh, three weeks old? <laughs> so um, she decided to go ahead and get the, get the dog tested. And the results came back, and um, it was basically five times normal for the, for the dog. It was elevators at five times normal. And that helped the workers' comp carrier. We actually put this in a letter to the company and the workers' comp carrier for the patient and said, look, the guy's not faking it. The dog's got mercury. It's from the house. And they accepted the claim. The dog and the owner got out for a while so the house could get cleaned. <clears throat> so then the vet clinic calls and says, OK, great. Where should we send the bill? <laughs> so who's going to pay for a bill for a urine mercury test for a dog um, who doesn't have any symptoms? And should I ask the owner to pay for that? Should the workers' comp pay for it? So it's a real problem, and there's no answer to it except that I paid the bill for this. It was like 150 bucks, but I, I couldn't figure out. I couldn't bill my clinic for it. We don't have a lot of money, so it's a real problem. It really showed me firsthand that there's a problem of it. And if you look at another example about zoonotic disease reduction risk in immunocompromised patients. We have lots of immunocompromised patients these days. HIV has been one source of immunocompromised patients in the past. But between chemotherapy for, for cancer and all the organ transplant patients that we have that we immediately put on immunosuppressive drugs, we have other conditions like arthritis where we put them on very immunosuppressive drugs. Um, when they're immunocompromised, they're at increased risk of getting zoonotic disease from pets and things like that. And studies have shown that doctors would rather have a veterinarian talk to the owner about how to take care and reduce risk, whether it's a iguana in the house that you have to really make a high-risk situation or make sure that the dogs have appropriate vaccinations and warming and things like that. The, the doctors don't want to deal with that. They want to have a vet do some prevention that way. But who's going to pay for a preventive visit of an immunocompromised person that you just did a, a liver transplant on, spent thousands of dollars with immunosuppressive drugs? Is anybody going to pay to get the dog and the cat and everything else at home, in the house treated in some preventive way to reduce the risk of, of zoonotic disease? It's, it's, doesn't, it's not on the radar of any of the health insurers, but maybe it should be of some. And, and one way to do this is to actually provide evidence that this kind of visit and preventive intervention with vets and doctors working together actually helps people be healthier and have fewer infections and things like that. And then if you set up some pilot protocols that show that it is cost effective, there may be ways to get insurance companies to somehow realize that the services that you do in veterinary medicine can actually benefit in humans as well. But we're not there yet, unfortunately. And the third thing I want to talk to you about is a barrier because I think it's been neglected, um, but it's a perfect one health coming together of human and animal medicine. And again, that's, this is my field of occupational health, and it's the health of animal workers that include any of you that are working with animals. Um, so here's the last case I'm going to show you, which is um, another true case, and someone I know, it hasn't been published, but many of you are probably aware of similar cases. And this is a veterinarian working in small animal practice, comes to his physician complaining of fever and fatigue, feels lousy, he's really feeling lousy, so that he's admitted to the hospital. They do a whole bunch of tests, try different things, and eventually nothing comes up positive. They don't really take an occupational history, which Dr. Schenker and I are always telling everybody, you know, you ask people what they do for work, and if any of you as veterinarians have gone to the doctor 
you probably don't always get asked that, or the doctor doesn't seem to know what you, it is you do all day and how that could be important. So as a result, this, this veterinarian was diagnosed again with fever of unknown origin. <clears throat> Some of the symptoms are red eyes, jaundice, uh, low, um, petechiae, little, little, you know, petechiae, little red dots in the skin, which are low platelets, abnormal liver function, and abnormal kidney function. So what do you think is going on? What's that? Yeah, leptosclerosis. Well, I wish the doctors had figured that out. It's a it, leptosclerosis. It was a delayed diagnosis finally made in this person. It's definitely an occupational disease of animal workers. We see it in slaughterhouse workers, farmers, and we see it in veterinarians. Um, it's very, you know, you know better than I, it's, it's very easily spread by urine or feces from an infected animal. And in about 10% of the human cases, it can be really bad and um, cause severe organ disease, including Wiles disease, which is sort of bleeding and kidney failure. Um, and that's what happened to this guy. He developed kidney failure. He had to go on dialysis, and then he got a kidney transplant. And because he then became immunocompromised, to stay on the, to avoid rejecting his kidney, he then could not work anymore in veterinary medicine because he'd had this occupational disease which had not been recognized. And when you think about it, when you think about all these, you know, big headline emerging infectious diseases around the world, you talk about SARS, which really first uh, came up in a bunch of food handlers. You talk about avian influenza, which is a disease of people working with chickens. These are occupational diseases of people working with animals, and this is how some of these new um, emerging often zoonotic diseases are, are emerging. And so the emerging zoonoses are really often occupational zoonoses, but we don't always do anything about that. And you know, you're all aware of this, but you think about the, the world's human population growing, and the way we're feeding a lot of this population is with many, many more animals. So the human, the, the food animal population of the, of the world is growing just as fast as this, and this is world meat production and production of, of poultry around the world. And this is pork production in a place like China, which is definitely using animal protein as a way to feed its expanding population. And the animal workers around the world run the whole spectrum from sort of pastoral uh, herders in Africa like this to bushmeat hunters in, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and people working in large facilities with pigs and chickens, which as you know that and I, are the two best ways to convert grain into protein on an animal basis to raise a lot of, of pork and, uh, and chickens. And so, you know, the, this is fed, and people at WHO even are saying, look, the only way we're gonna feed the world is with confinement facilities, and not everybody loves animal confinement, but small-scale farming may not be a way to provide enough protein for the world, and so these things are being um, built, and, and uh, large concentrations of animals are just the way of life around the world. And However, it's also connected with live animal markets and abattoirs, and uh, it's just a perfect way for emerging diseases to, um, to infect both animals and people. And this is probably an example you know about, but just to show you that this is really an occupational situation, this is Nipah virus uh, emerging in Malaysia several years ago, a very highly fatal virus that nobody had ever seen before, killed several hundred people in the initial outbreak. And it, it, it originated in pig farms that looked like this when you fly over an airplane over parts of Malaysia um, that have been built right next to big uh, areas of rainforest. And uh, you know, you sort of cheap land and you kind of knock down a bunch of trees and build your big confinement facility for a lot of thousands of pigs right next to it. And what they didn't think about, as you know, was that there were flying foxes and in the in the forest who thought that putting a pig farm next to them was a great new source of food for them and the closer they could hang out around the pig farm and eat some of the pig food and put their droppings everywhere was great. Unfortunately they were the reservoir for nipple virus and other related viruses that had really not been seen in either animals or, or in food animals or people before but led to a, um, a, you know, this major outbreak which killed initially mostly pig workers. It also killed a lot of pigs, and it also killed dogs and cats around the pig farms as well. So the dogs and cats were sentinels as well for something very strange going on. But it was really, I think of it, as an occupational medicine problem. It somehow crossed from the rainforest and the bats uh, and the flying foxes to the pigs and to the people, and that's how it became a big epidemic in the humans. 
And then when you think about animal health people, veterinarians, um, and some of the work on their health has been done at Davis, depending on which report you need, you know, the, the rate of occupational disease that you experience compared to physicians is two to three times as much. And the rate of occupational injuries from working from bites and scratches and kicks and things like that is, uh, is almost 30 times as great as the medical profession. So this is a profession uh, definitely showing both infectious disease and a lot of other risks as well. At the same time, um, if, once you get out of the university setting, there are very few preventive occupational programs for either swine workers, poultry workers, people in markets, or veterinary workers. And I'm talking about veterinarians as well as vet techs, vet assistants in animal hospitals around this country and around the world. There just is not um, sort of a realization that maybe preventive programs for these groups would be a good idea. But when you think about it, if you think that maybe it would be good to be have better occupational health for all these groups and do some prevention, because we feel that that is one way to prevent both transmission from disease as well as to keep this whole workforce healthy, the only way you're going to do that is to have kind of take a one health approach and have veterinary health people who really know what it is to take care of animals. They need to be involved in trying to design the best programs and help and help them uh, succeed. And when it comes to things like uh, food safety, it's very interesting that in general, both in this country and around the world, um, we pay no more attention to food safety. We want to eliminate any risk of infectious disease as well as toxic problems in, in food and in an animal and meat and other animal products. Um, <clears throat> so we spend a lot of resources looking at ways to eliminate these risks at the source as much as possible. And there should be a, a very natural way to connect that to the health of the workers. And it's often really not done. There's nobody looking after the health of workers in food production, animal food production. We, we really care more about the safety of the, of the food itself, and then we care more about the health of the animals than we do about the health of the workers. And when it comes to something like H1N1, it makes it very clear that you can get in fact the, the biggest one of the biggest risks to the animal health is the health of the workers. That if workers have flu, they're going to infect the pigs. And if we don't spend any time working the health of the of the workers, you're not going to be able to have the kind of animal health and food safety that you really want. And bringing environmental health back into the sort of One Health equation again, when we try to solve any other occupational health problems, we'd like to know kind of what's in the environment, how much, how much bacteria or virus is in the dust or on the surfaces of things that we should be careful with. And we need to go out and sort of look at the health of the environments around animal production, whether it's a market or a confinement facility or a small scale farm. Um, and by understanding the health of the environment better, we could actually help keep the workers healthier and the animals healthier at the same time. So in summary, to go from some health to one health, there's different ways, but what I'm really proposing is that um, we deal with these three barriers, the us versus them attitude, the question of who pays, and the neglect of the occupational health of animal workers by moving from an us versus them, where animals cause scary zoonotic disease and we should just eliminate the animals or keep them as far away from people as possible to more of a shared risk idea where we look at shared exposure to environmental hazard and the whole idea of canaries and coal mines and, uh, and animals being sentinels for humans and humans being sentinels for animals and really sharing information about that. And I think we need to figure out uh, if, if One Health really is a good model and it actually does help improve both animal health and human health, there should be a way to prove that and to show that it actually saves money and that there's a way to get reimbursed for doing some of that kind of work in your clinical care in this country or anywhere else. And to really think about um, having more collaboration between occupational health or primary care and veterinary health in the occupational health of animal workers. And that that's really only going to improve, I think, if we work together in kind of a one health model. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, I'll probably give a little bit of time for discussion.